So I'm Dave. And I'm Sean. This is Barstool's and Van Talk. And boy, oh boy, my friend Sean always uses this term, but it's true. We have a, a barn burner tonight uh, with, uh, I guess, the most paramount talk radio host in Halifax today. Uh, we've been on a show just recently. Sean, I'll let you bring him on. Yeah, I... Uh from time to time, listen to a lot of talk radio. Uh, I've always loved Todd Vino. He's, uh, he's got a real dry kind of uh, style. Uh, the thing I've always liked about him is whatever his opinion is, his opinion is, and he doesn't, he's not afraid to share it. And um, so he's, um, you know, he's a lot of fun. He's a musician too. And we'll cover that. Uh, yeah. He's a Leafs fan. We're recording this on, uh, I'm going to, predict that the Leafs take the series 4-1 tonight and Todd will be a very happy man tomorrow also want to point out we got Alex on the show here with us Alex is doing a bang up job Barstools is taking it up a notch and it's all because of uh, all because Alex's hard work so thanks a lot brother You're so without any further ado we have News 95.7's own Todd Vino so you should be here right about now Good day, there sir. he is. Hope your ears weren't burning. We were saying very nice things about you now, Todd. <laughs> That's not a good thing. <laughs> so I, I want to start off. Um, so you've been filling in for Rick now for uh, for a few weeks. Um, but you, you've had your own show uh, on the weekends and stuff, and you've kind of dropped in. Um, have you been getting any feedback about from people about uh, your style is obviously very different than Rick's? I had somebody the other day say, sometimes with Todd, it's like your, your cranky uncle giving you the finger <laughs> wag. And I kind of laughed, right? But have you been getting any feedback from, from Rick's followers uh, about – I think you're doing a great job. I, I, I told you the other day I like your style, but you getting any feedback from people? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you get lots of feedback. Uh, I think for the most part, people, I had the good fortune of working with Rick quite a bit. Uh, he and I did our face off and I sat in for Rick a lot over the uh, over a couple of years. So I think that was uh, people that kind of connected me with Rick anyway. So it wasn't like bringing somebody brand new in who people didn't know at all. That would be a lot rougher to sit in for Rick, right? Because Rick's got a crazy loyal following. He's a He's a talk show icon and, you know, there's not a lot of those guys around anymore. So uh, I think for the most part, because of that, people have accepted me and, and put up with me, I guess. So, uh, but, you know, you got people who are going to be, uh, you know, they're just not going to be satisfied anyway. And I, I'm OK with that. You know, if some but the point is, is if somebody's emailing me and they're complaining about what I'm doing, they're, they're at least listening. And, you know, and that's, if you're not getting any of that, I, I honestly think you're doing, you're not doing the job properly, but so to answer your question, yeah, lots of feedback, a lot of people missing rec, but some love too. So. Well, I want to ask you a question now, Todd. So I want to know how you get started in talk radio in the first place. Oh, well, that's, first of all, this is a very different, awkward position for me to be answering questions. You know, I'd like to ask the questions as you guys know. About. No, I'm just kidding. I had the good fortune of producing another talk show icon out of St. John Rogers news 95, seven once had Rogers had two green brand stations in New Brunswick as well. And they were all sister stations. One was a uh, talk radio in St. John. Another was Moncton. And I had a regional talk show on all three of them, including, including news 95, seven, about eight for about four years. And I inherited that show by producing a, a guy who's in the kind of similar to Rick had 50 years experience doing talk show, came out of retirement to help launch the stations, was an absolute talk show icon. Tom Young, he's now passed away, moved back to Newfoundland. But I produced Tom for a few years, for a couple of years, and sat in for him a bit here and there. But I learned the trade from him. I learned a lot about that. And, and I often said, any level of success that I've ever had has only been achievable because I had the opportunity to to work with a guy like Tom Young for, for a couple of years, just kind of learning the rhythm of it and how to deal with people and how to validate people and how to know when to do certain things. You just, if you had to learn that on your own, it would be a nightmare, right? So, so I uh, sat in or either I produced him and then I sat in for him. And then when he retired, I kind of inherited his seat much in the same way with Rick, because people associated me with this guy for two years, producing him, sitting in for him, bantering with him on the air. So right. people were willing to put up with me in the same way, kind of like Rick. It's funny how that transitioned into that. But so then I hosted talk radio for uh, that show for uh, about four years and Roger sold those two new Burnswick stations 
and uh, that was kind of the end of my talk show legacy until, uh, <laughs> until they moved me to Halifax. A few years later, I was doing some VJing stuff for Global News and some other stuff, podcasting. And uh, they moved me to Halifax to uh, do a weekend show, which I was happy to do, uh, quite honestly. You know, I was just glad to be back and talk radio. And Rogers, once again, after a couple of years with this pandemic, blew out three quarters of the staff and the station and just no revenue, right? And in fairness to the company. Um, but uh, now Rick, of course, has had his health issues and, and I'm back for a while anyway. So that's kind of my boring story. <laughs> So, I mean, you got, you run the gamut when you're, you know, you're in Rick's the same thing. I mean, like there's a lot of topics, you get uh, a lot of time to fill, but um, how much prep do you put into deciding what a show is going to be? Cause I've heard Rick when he's on the air talking about, you know, he starts very early in the morning and yeah. how much, how, how many days out, or is it just kind of the day before that you kind of start putting the thing together? Yeah. Well, I mean, these are, these are good questions. I mean, First of all, Rick put in uh, way too many hours, in my opinion, for goodness sakes. He was there at four in the morning. I never figured that out. To be completely honest with you, he did it four in the morning. Um, but um, when I was when I first got into producing talk radio for Tom Young, I would produce the show, actually. He would give me some story ideas, some content that he liked. But over half of it would be the producer's job to pull all that together, to schedule it all. To, and it's an immense amount of work. But with time, for whatever reason, producers got away from doing that. They became operators of the, at the controls, you know, during the live show, but they didn't book anything and they still don't uh, because they work in the newsroom and do other things and, and it's just lean and mean. So as the host, you also have to produce everything, meaning you got to book everything, you got to schedule everything, you got to get all the ideas. So my process is pretty simple. Um, I've got some go-to people. Uh, that I like to have some regulars on who I just have developed relationships over the years. There's often topics that'll come up and they'll be, I know exactly what I want to talk to, whether it be a Wayne McKay, a uh, law professor at Dal or whatever it is, you know, it's, you get those go-to people. But my other process uh, is I'll go through about nine or 10 uh, news related websites, the Chronicle Herald, whatever it is, some obscure stuff every morning and, and whatever, if I see a headline that grabs my interest that says that would be good talk radio, then I'll copy and paste the, uh, the website. I keep, I'll list them all. Once I go through all of that, then I go through everything and I start finding names, finding emails, finding numbers. It's very laborious, right? And, um, and it's a lot of the work. So quite honestly, the, most, the majority of my time is spent doing that stuff and prepping the show and getting ready for the show and the lineup is comes last that's the last thing i do and oftentimes it's it's i don't have enough time to really do it the way i want but that also lends itself to a good conversation sometimes too when you're not over prepped uh, i read everything through a couple of times and then at some point you just kind of put it away and you say okay i've, I've absorbed as much as that as i can the guest is coming on. Sometimes you have no idea what you're going to ask them when they first, when they start. Usually I don't really quite know what I'm going to go at. And it just kind of happens. Um, that's right. So it's just, uh, it's like performing guys. You know what that's like, right? Sometimes you're feeling something and, and if you overthink it, it's just not going to happen. Right. Um, so it's, that's my process, but it's the, the product, the producing, and the script and, and the, the lineup writing and the finding people's emails and phone numbers and all of that back and forth is not that I'm complaining because it's still better than a lot of things people do. But it's, it's, you have to be extremely organized, efficient, and you have to really be a hard worker to get the job done every day. Well, you sure do a good job. That's funny because I would think of Rick's tagline and it always touches me. If you're not enraged and you're not paying attention and it's true, Sean has a lot more tolerance for this than I do because when I, if I go through a full five week period or five day period and I listen to 95.7 while I'm driving around, I will, I'll get that anger and that upset. Like it, it just drives me crazy. I'm wondering how you do it. How do you maintain your composure with some of the guests that call into your show, half of them I want to throttle, half of your guests I want to throttle. I don't know how you do it, brother. Like, I don't understand. Well, I mean, I'm half the time people want to throttle me. So, you know, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I know that, right? Um, quite honestly, it's, I use, you separate, I separate myself from what's going on. It's like, if you work, if you guys know what it's like, you're out playing gigs 
and you might be in the shittiest mood you've ever been in in your life and things aren't going good or what, but you know what, when the lights come on and everybody's having a good time and they want to have, they want the band to be into it. And whether it's, your day's sucking or not, doesn't matter. Right. It, you know? It's your job then. Yeah. It's, it's your job. job. Right? Yeah. And you learn as a pro from guys like Tom Young and Rick Howe that you just answer it every day and you just, you let that stuff happen. And when the show's done, you say, it's just another show. None of that meant anything other than that next. Right. It's just you can't get too wrapped up in it. You can't take it too personally. You can't take your tell yourself seriously, too seriously. You know, it's in the end, at the end of the day, it's it's a, it is what it is. It's 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 an important job, but it's not who I am. It's what I do. And I just separate it in that way. You can't. Eh? OK, cool. So I, 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 used anyway. to, Try. I used to love listening to the uh, the face off. And I remember one. I don't remember exactly when it was but it had something to do with you were you were debating rick about uh justin trudeau and you're basically rick was basically saying you're you're blue and you were saying well you're a trudeau fan and it was funny because you just kept you you were going come on but you were, weren't doing it in a mean way and rick was getting worked up and i was thinking like hey were you in the studio and you guys that like, kind of come to blows when you're in there um but it was just it was really funny because it was just like <laughs> sharp circling the uh you know y- you had him and you knew you had him and he said a couple trio things a couple times and it was great radio because it was a good good little joke there for a good two three minutes yeah well i mean when that's done we sit there and laugh right you know when we go to break it's like Rick loves it. That's what he wants. You know, he, oh, yeah? he wants that acrimony. He wants that rigid whatever that people like to listen to. And Rick's another example of somebody who gets it and doesn't take it personally. It's not about me or Rick. It's about it's about entertaining. Like, I, you know, Katie uh, Hartai, who left recently as the producer of the show to work for CBC, we had a conversation the last day on the air. And... Um, and I, I said to her, I said, I said, Katie, I said, what do you think is the most important thing that you do in the talk radio? And she said, tell, uh, inform people. I said, no, I said, that's not what it is. It's you entertain people. And if you're not entertaining them, then you're not informing them because they're not going to listen. It's really as simple as that. You know, we can have this lofty goal of we're uh, in the inform- information business and this is what we do. We elevate people with our intellect. No, you entertain them. You, you introduce conversation and dialogue, and sometimes it's ugly, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's not, but that's what you do. Is you, your goal is to entertain people. So Rick gets that, right? Yeah. Speaking of entertaining, now I understand you're a bit of a musician yourself, and I did not know that. Yeah, I've played a lot over the years. I'm from uh, St. John and uh, lived in New Brunswick around the province and, and did, did a lot of gigging, a lot of not, not to the, I would say, extent that you guys have done. I've never been signed to a label or anything like that. Um, but I consider myself a, a competent um, player. Um, you know, I, I love playing. I've played with some amazing musicians over the years. I've been very lucky to play with some great players. And I've played with some guys who aren't great too and always had fun, right? And um, so I, I enjoy it. Uh, I play with uh, with a band in Halifax here called Iron Wheel. They do all original kind of Americana, blue stuff, um, which is a nice change for me because I've, I've not played that type of music. Um, so I'm a guitar player, bass player, and, and I love to sing and I consider myself a good harmony singer. Um, so yeah, but you know, it always amazes me how much talent's around, right? It's just like the, the Maritimes in general, you guys know this, it's just like, there's just crazy players everywhere. Like everywhere. Yeah. You're so right. Yeah. You're so right. They had, uh, today they were talking about, um, the seventh New Brunswick kind of open back up and except everybody, except Nova Scotians, which. Uh, I was supposed to play Dolan's Pub <laughs> the oh, week, yeah. weekend. Fredericton, Fredericton. Yeah, so that's probably not going to happen until July. But you mentioned St. John, one of the bars that I absolutely love and have played all kinds of times is O'Leary's. We yeah. always had so much fun there. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm from St. John, so you're you're speaking to me right now. There so. you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, O'Leary's is great. I've played O'Leary's not on the Saturday nights when he when he brings in the out of town bands, the hot shots from Halifax, like you guys. Um, <laughs> but we. We got some front room stuff at O'Leary's and, and, and the odd time when a Halifax band would, would have to cancel, he would resort to us. Um, but uh, no, it's, uh, I love playing, you know, it's, it's great. Um, but, you know, you guys know what it's like. It's a grind sometimes to, yeah. to do some of those gigs and you're out till four in the morning and you're load lugging gear and 
you know, I ain't getting younger. I don't know what yeah, it, really. you guys, but it's not, you know, but it's still fun to do. But my the desire for me to be a working gigging guy for the 150 or 200 bucks that, that my ilk of bands would get a night each, you know, would not. I'm not sure that I'm motivated to do that anymore, to be honest with you. I think last time we did that, we played at Cheers, and I think we, we finished at four o'clock and got home at that quarter to five. I had to work at eight thirty. It's like you know what, fellas, yeah. this is not my gig anymore. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, but it's still like that. The Yellow House is still at late night, is Sean? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I'm in a band. Dolan's David and I are in a band. Night. Sorry, go ahead, Todd. Dolan's is a late night, is it not? Uh, not two o'clock. Dolan's is a bagger because I love playing that place, but it's three fifty-five minute sets. Exactly. Ooh, yeah. So I have to pee. Somewhere's giving it. I play in town. It's forty-five. So we're kind of spoiled in Halifax. So three fifty-fives. But I'll tell you, pound for pound, one of my favorite places. Barry Hughes that owns that place and his staff are just amazing. Great people that go there. Um, and you know, like I said, I saw that today that they weren't opening. They're opening in the seventh, but not to West Nova Scotia. So it kind of broke my heart a little bit because yeah. yeah. Fredericton's like uh, it's like a vacation when we go and play there. It's just so much fun. It's a great um, city. It's a great. Oh story. yes, and you know it's funny because Barry, we went there one time, and I don't know if you've ever met Barry or not, but he's a funny guy. And so we go to the bar, and he says, "Have you guys ever been to the Farmers Market?" And it's like Barry, I've been to Dolan's, and I've been to the apartment that we stay at. That's pretty much yeah. it. Because you're playing, and then you get back late, and you might have a few pops, and you sleep in, and you know, so you don't have it. It's yeah. it's not as sexy as what everybody thinks it is. Yeah. You know, it's a series of long naps in the afternoon to get ready to play for the night, right? Yeah. It's fun though. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, that particular band, I mean, Dave and I are in a band that we started with, with bar stools called Side Hustle, but I'm in a band called The Frequency. And one year we played 85 shows. And I mean, and we're all part-time guys, you know, if, if you will. So it's, uh, it can be a grind, but um, it keeps you young sometimes too. Yeah. That's right, Todd. So you still playing at all, Todd? Or like, are yeah, you I still, still play. Yeah, I still play. Uh, like I said, I'm playing in, uh, playing bass with that band. Uh, I do a lot of, uh, I'm playing a lot of acoustic right now. That was my roots kind of acoustic. I get into a lot of electric over the years with the bands, but uh, I love playing uh, the old stuff like James Taylor. And oh, fun. All that stuff. You know, that's, that's, I'm a big Grateful Dead fan. Uh, okay. Been to a few of their shows back in the day when Jerry was kicking around. Nice. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I still play. Absolutely. You know, as long as I have the ability to, Make it, make it, make the guitar do anything at all. I'll always be at it, right? Well, we'll have to make a date now to have a little jam session now between the three of us here, anyhow. That would be my absolute honor. Yeah, no, we would. Uh, I, I'd yeah. love to sing. I'd love that. I'd love to sing harmony. If you ever, if you ever like, wanting to have somebody over to lay in some harmony, I'm your guy. I love her. Perfect. Perfect. As soon, as soon as we can get to Dave's actually at the jam space where we, we practice. So as soon as we can open it up again, uh, absolutely. We'll get you over and we'll have some fun. It's, uh, it's always you know, fun. You know, the funny thing is, is that uh, I was kind of, you know, vocalist only who didn't play instruments. Like, you know, you got your odd Robert Plant, David Lee Roth, and some of these guys that can pull that off. But, you know, you never, we never knew any, any real vocalist around. There was always somebody in the band playing something, saying that was me, right? Yeah, and I always yeah. thought that'd be a sweet gig just to be a vocalist, show up with your mic and rock out and watch that the band does all the work. And, you know, that'd be kind of fun if you had the vocal chops to do it. Well, okay. we, we got a girl singer in this band. Michelle Ryder, her name is in the Side Hustle Band, and she is just that. She's just all that. You know, she just brings her vocal prowess. Yeah. And that's just trying to keep up. It, it's and, just, and I think that's uh, cool because it, it, having that front person not playing something, they can devote to that that commitment to that vocal and to the performance. It's yeah. There's a reason why the Robert Plant exists that without an instrument, right? So, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. Yep. I want to shift gears a little bit before, but before we do, you're a bass player. You said, are you a bass player that does or doesn't load gear? Oh, I got to load gear, man. You always got the big 15 inch cabinet speaker. Yes. On. Okay. You know? <laughs> so uh, I guess I, I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to get you on another segment to do a seminar on bass players loading gear. Cause I don't play with too many bass players that load gear. So. Well, it's always, I it's do. always a I do. On the guitar players that don't want to lug anything. Yeah, that's, that's right. Who it usually is. So hitting the, hitting other chicks. Hey, yeah, you can wrap yeah. papers with me, baby. You can wrap yeah, papers with right. me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so shifting gears just a little bit here, Todd. So obviously, you know, that we the last year we've been in this whole deal here, and you know, it kind of looks like there's a bit of a light, a light at the end of the tunnel. But how have you found? And I talked to you about this the other day, or we yeah. talked about it. Um, from somebody that's in the media that's covering this stuff on a regular basis, and you have people that are calling in. 
How, how have you found a the communication that goes out to the public and be the communication that you experience in order to kind of get the right answers has been? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's not been good at all. Um, but unfortunately, it's people's expectations. I think of of communications of the of government in general right now isn't isn't what it should be because we've kind of entered this era where there's this set there's sector there's this portion of the population that that believes it's patriotic at this point to do and listen to everything government says and right. you should not question Dr. Strang and you can, what are you questioning the premier for they're taking care of us they're keeping us safe and this type of but the reality is is that it's it's these are people who we questioned every step of the way in good times and they made plenty of mistakes in good times now that we know they were good times couldn't get much right procurement whatever yeah. so now suddenly we're under under the under crucial times right now and the idea is they're they're going to be perfect right now and, and beyond uh you know criticism so one of the one of the criticisms i guess would be is that they have not they've not communicated well because they really haven't i don't want to say haven't had to but there's no uh the opposition doesn't have a voice right now uh, the part of the legend does not sit uh, the ledge didn't sit for a year for goodness sakes i mean they the, yeah. the government wrapped up wrapped up and went home and said you know we're under we're, we're this covid we are no longer operating anymore i mean it's you still get paid but we're not operating yeah right. yeah exactly exactly you know it's so it's I don't know. And and that's the other thing is that, you know, I, I, I'll I defend uh, in many cases the public sector. I'm not a member of the public sector, obviously, never have been. Um, but I'll defend those who work in the public sector uh, because, you know, I would take advantage of the situation, too, if I had one of those jobs. Um, but the reality is, is nobody in the public sector has taken a haircut in any way. They haven't. I've not known of one layoff in any municipality, any mm -hmm. province, the federal government, not one. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, businesses have been shuttered. Uh, people have paid the price. Uh, I've lost a job. I'm an example directly of somebody who's been hit in this. So, um, you know, the communication, I guess, how do you how do you how do you communicate that? You say we're all in this together. But the reality is it's not. A, but but I'm not bitter about it. Like I said, it's not personal for me again. Back to that. People who have that opportunity, I would love to have a good federal government job where I don't have to worry about getting laid off in times like this. But the, the reality is that a lot of the most, a lot of other people have that worry. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it's back to the communication. I guess it's, you know, it's, it's not been good. Businesses have not been told uh, in advance uh, much of anything, what to expect. Uh, how do you operate uh, bars? How do you operate restaurants? How do you, you know, even this bubble, you know, we're talking about this bubble. Well, you know what? It could not, ha maybe it doesn't happen. Like there's not, you can't count on anything right now. Right. So that's a question I had for you because now tomorrow, tomorrow will be the 29th, 28th uh, of May. And that's supposed to be the big course. It always happens on a Friday. So they can't, yeah. you can't complain because the weekend right. comes up. The right. big announcement is supposed to come tomorrow for about the, reopen of the provinces i want to get your predictions Todd, because you are immersed in this shit like you know todd or sean listens to it every day i listen to what i can but you are absolutely immersed in this every single day 24 7 so what do you think is going to happen tomorrow you don't well i think they're going to promise and they're going to set dates they're going to set targets but it's going to be with the caveat of if this happens if this happens if 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 if, if and 10 ifs and, and you know what, we just don't know what's going to happen. So I, what I've been suggesting that needs to happen is they need to say, look, we've got our vaccination rates. We've got empirical data right now. We know where we're trending. This is the number that we're going to be at. You could pretty much nail it by July, whatever. Yep. Say if it's 75%, whatever it is, this is what the epidemiology, this is what the science has been telling us all along. So no matter what, folks, if numbers spike a bit here and there, or whatever this summer, we are doing this bubble. We're going to have to make this work because we need it. Businesses, it's going to happen. But they won't say that. They'll say, if cases don't go up, if, 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 if. So you can't take that to the bank. If you're if you're in business or you're relying on anything or you want to book uh, reservations or anything, you, you can't rely on any of them. So I, I, I think they'll lay out a big plan. But you know what? It could all go out the window like that. 
Yep. And the thing is, too, when they, they give guidance, and, and Sean, this takes it back to when I sort of first met you, um, when I was challenging the province on things about closures, uh, I would ask them questions, and they would come back with very vague, wide-open answers so that you could never, ever pin it down to saying, well, if you were to get a fine or something, you have evidence from the government saying, oh, well, you could do this. No, they would they would gate it in a way that that it could always be – judge 10 different ways yep. i just wanted to add that in because they're never clear on it never clear on it and 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 this whole thing has been in many ways uh just a contradiction of contradictions i mean you know this is all this is nothing i'm not breaking any news here you guys all know this but when 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 you can go into packed pretty much packed stores and there have been packed stores cost oh, yeah. reports across yeah. the board loaded yeah. Right, yep. Walmart's go down the list, and these people are off food courts. Yeah, the food, food courts, courts. and yep. and a guy can't operate his business, or a guy or woman can't operate their business with one in the store at a time to buy a guitar, or I mean, Long and McQuaid, or like that's not essential, right? You know, like Absolutely. I don't think they're open. I don't know if they are or not, but they're probably not open. Curbs but if a yeah. nursery can be open, or, or rather a, a greenery or whatever, to go buy plants, which is fine. But I need my music fix. Where's my music store? Right, so people are making exactly. these stupid rules that make no friggin' sense, yeah. right? It's just not equality, and this is what we talk right. about all, all across the, the board. It's like if it was the same for everybody, it'd be great. But I'm in commission sales. What about somebody who's a travel agent? What, exactly. How's your business doing? Well, how about you know, like how about the the, uh, the churches? How about the pastor of a church? You know, how's he doing right now? You can't have right. social gatherings. You know, every industry is suffering, but not every person is suffering the same way and that's what bugs me I and mean, it's all, now our friends who are only play music for a living <laughs> they have no income no. zero nothing and it's even beyond that it's it's the it's the it's the momentum you lose for a year plus building up your your customer your client base i mean yep. if you're in sales and you're you're used to working that network you get now you might have lost a half of those people that's right. Bands that were doing dolans in these places, maybe they've broken up, maybe that somebody couldn't stick around or whatever, and you've lose. So now you got to try and restart that over again. You know, people, it's, it's immeasurable the damage here that's happened is with this stuff. And there was a segment, Todd, that you had on your show that I want to ask you about in a second because I was, I was getting ready to listen to it. It was last week and then I had to go into a sales meeting. But the one thing I think that when all this stuff, stuff it's going to be very, off-putting for me is when I go downtown to a bar the first time and I see all these politicians backslapping and drinking beer during happy hour and patting themselves on the back for all the good work that they've done. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying all of them, but you, you nailed it where, you know, they don't have any skin in the game because they haven't lost anything. And, you know, when the premier makes the comment, you know, uh, uh, I understand you guys haven't had an income for the month of May. Well, how do you understand that when you have, yeah. but what are you, you, um, you were covering a point about an email that Dr. Strang sent out to the MLAs, and I was about to listen to the segment, and I had to leave. Touch on that a little bit, because that was very interesting. Well, he sent a letter out to MLA saying uh, if people want to find get exemptions for travel, if memory serving me correctly, travel exemptions to get into the province, or family members, or, or any of that type of a scenario, uh, do not, if people contact you, MLA, do not entertain that. Just basically point them to the website, which gives them the rules. Don't do any legwork for them because we're not allowing any of this. And Tim Houston, rightfully so, and I'll criticize Tim Houston like I'll criticize anybody, and I do, but I'll also point out if I agree with something one of these guys or girls does, uh, took exception to that and said that, you know, you got no right, Dr. Strang, to be telling me or any MLA not to do some legwork for their constituent. That's why they, we are here. And that's their and job. It, that's right. And if a constituent reaches out to me as an MLA and says, look, I got an issue with travel exemptions. I want some help. And I entertain that. Con and I, they got a case. I'm going to go to I'm going to go work, go to bat for them. I'm not going to not do that because you told me to, Dr. Strang. That is overreach big yeah. time. Right. And, and, and to me, that's a cut and dry case of this ain't right. And, and, you know, I, I don't see it. There's some things are black and white. And to me, that's crossing the line. Well, we've heard this story a few times where people are like, hey, do they have too much power now? Hey, are we getting close to martial law? Hey, hey, hey. What about all these things? I guess nobody wants the job. Nobody foresaw a global pandemic two and a half year, or two years ago. 
but it's here. And they're getting paid exceptional amount of monies to be an exceptional thinker outside the box, and they deserve to be a little bit more accountable than they have been. That's all our point has been. We put a petition forth that's okay. Just meet with the people who who are matter like they matter these people matter hear, please hear their voice and, yeah. and crickets so what are you going to do well dr strang has become a, a pop icon almost in the province like <laughs> <laughs> I, I think i heard something called strangism the other day they've called yeah, it, yeah, to it yeah and uh, i don't know that's a good thing right a public health officer should not be a personality in my opinion uh they they uh, he sits along the premier every every day and it's like who's in charge here which one of these people one is elected by the people <laughs> and one is is a, is a public servant that's done this job hired to do this job and and not democratically accountable who is making these decisions and i think that that is a, a legitimate question to to ask and i think that uh, dr strang uh, through his premier uh, does and i'm not and it's not conspiracy theorizing or, or anything like that it's just called seeing it observing this and and looking at this dynamic of these of how they and it's the same in all provinces now the public health officer and the premier these are the two most powerful people in the province right now in every province in canada and uh i think that's when we've got a legislative assembly we've elected 55 of these people to represent the pro the people in the province and the power is rests so heavily on these massive decisions on two people one not elected i see that as a potential problem at the very least yeah I, and I think, you know, like or not like Stephen McNeil, I think the feeling he always got from him was that uh, he was a tough guy. He, you know, he, obviously you, you saw him kind of lose his cool a little bit sometimes, but I, Ian Rankin gets in there and you just kind of get the feeling that he he's almost getting rolled in some of these meetings. I just don't have a solid feeling that he's going to stand up and let's call it what it is. He wasn't elected premier. He was elected by his party to become premier. So maybe that's weighing on it too. But um, I just, I don't get the feeling he goes into a room and throws down and comes, you know what I mean? Oh, totally. Yeah. Ian Rankin is, I'm, I, you know what? I didn't know much about him um, before he was the premier and I still don't know much about him. Uh, I, no. I just, he was this nondescript kind of low key guy. So when he got elected, uh, I thought to myself, okay, well, let's see what this guy must be dynamic. Uh, he won the leadership of the Liberal Party, and and uh, you know he must have he must be have something going for him. And I haven't seen it. Uh, quite honestly, I've not seen anything to me that would say, wow, this guy's a standout politician, or, or you know, he's just he 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 is very very timid at this point. And I think Dr. Strang is probably controlling that relationship. Well, it's funny you said that. You said you're talking about Dr. Strain and you talked about his premier. Like, hmm, that's an interesting choice of words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I'd like to like bang on, Stephen. Yeah, the trait. Stephen McNeil was uh, Stephen McNeil was a personality. Oh yeah. Uh, pop icon almost again similar stay the blazes uh, hole exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you got the completely antithesis of that in this guy and Dr. Strang is filling that vacuum. Uh, I would say is probably what's happening. Yeah. So we want to be respectful of your time, sir, because we know yeah. there's a big game coming on. So I'd like you to do two things. Um, one, yeah, uh, uh, you're gonna do the you're gonna do the first one last. Mm -hmm. I want I want you got to, you got a couple of axes behind you there. So I, I want you to sh show our viewers oh. exactly what I'm seeing over your, your oh, shoulder. Okay, sure. This guy here is my uh, 74 SG. Nice, which, uh. which is an absolute beauty. I love this thing. Um, what else do I got? My acoustic that I have right here now is this Yamaha. Just a yeah, you can't go wrong with the Yamaha guitar, nope. right? You're right. You can't, you can't kill it. it. You can't kill it. You're you right. Can't kill it, and it always works. And to that, uh, my bass is also a Yamaha. This is a nice bass, which ah, I'm... nice. Yeah, and uh, I just got to, oh, I'll show you one more. This is just a Squire Telecaster, but I bought it when I was 16, and. Um, this is uh, I, this. If this thing could talk, boys, I would be in trouble. I'll tell you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Usually say that about SGs, but uh... yeah. But I bought that when I was sixteen. The SG I got when I was in my forties, so it didn't have nearly as much fun as the Delhi did. Beautiful. Now here we go. I said you're a smart man. Uh, you're going to go and watch this hockey game here, um, and I, I 
I, I always joke around. I don't know if you, you know, what, what's worse than a Leafs fan and that'd be an ex Leafs fan. So that's me. <laughs> I don't have a horse in the race, so I really don't care. Who's, who's winning this game tonight? Well, before I ask you that, when did you drop the Leafs? <laughs> I dropped the Leafs when they hired Mike Babcock, truthfully. Oh, isn't that right, eh? Man, he um, could be a bust, eh? $5 million a year, did, man. And I just found that the team kind it's of went, money. Um, a little bit of a – I just found they got a little bit too skilled. But when they couldn't protect their stars and they just made a, you know, a choice to kind of move some some guys out of, out of there to do that, I just I – just, I didn't like it. I understand that's where the game was going and they had to kind of collect some of those guys. But, you know, Babcock's just a – He's just a caricature, right? So oh, I just—I yeah. mean, he won the cup in Detroit. Those teams were just unbelievable. Those players right. that he had, right? So they were. Um, well, you, there you go. So you gave up on them. I almost quit. Well, I, you know what? I've given up a lot on the Leafs when they lost to Boston, when they were up uh, in Game Seven in Boston, four to one with twelve minutes to go, could have eliminated the, the mighty Bruins, who I think went on to win the cup that year, and uh, they they choked and gave up four, uh, three goals and lost in overtime. It was. I kind of checked out then. Um, but you know what? If the Leafs were ever to win the Stanley Cup, it would be in a year in which they couldn't celebrate with a parade, which would be this. <laughs> fitting. So, so fitting. Okay. So I'm saying that just, just to be dicks, they're going to win the Cup. <laughs> with socially distanced flipping and burning cars, right? <laughs> Six feet apart. Six feet apart. No, right. on. no, so no fans in the stands. That'll yeah. be the Leafs going around with the Stanley Cup going, woo. I've, I've, I've never thought of that perspective before. That's hilarious. So, okay, so who's winning, who's winning the game tonight? Leafs will win tonight. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think they'll win tonight. They're a better team than Montreal. Montreal's just not a very – they don't have a lot of luck going on there. We'll talk uh, about another what, two weeks or so and see, see if we can get some more predictions there. Sean, we, we really appreciate you coming on our show, you know, and thank you so much for having us on our show. I mean, Sean and I talk, I talk about this a lot. We knew when we first started first, it was a band talk. It was kind of to, to be a positive distraction of all the crap that was going on was shortly after the port of uh, murders that happened and obviously in the middle of the global pandemic. But we might have a positive site where people just to go to, just to kind of lose themselves for a little while, you know, maybe reflect, have some some memories of the old days, talk with some music, just fun things. But we knew that we were in a negative news cycle. And the, when we tried to kind of get our brand out there, nobody would take a chance on us. You did, Sheldon McLeod did, Rick Howe did, Liz Rigney did. There's a few that, that uh, Tom Bedell from Kino 4, but it was hard to do that. So we want to thank you for, for kind of including us on, on your forum too. Oh no, absolutely! It's great, and I'll definitely we'll we'll keep in touch and and uh, anytime, and I'd love to have you guys back on. Anytime you want to complain and bitch and moan about the government, you get a hold of me, and I'll get you on the Rick Howe show. You have my email address now. You have my email address. I can go on for hours. <laughs> to, Dave's point, to Dave's point, Todd, because you've been so nice to us, that's why we're going to get you in the jam, and it will. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. You got to bring uh, you got to bring the telly, and you got to bring the SG though. Okay, yeah. no sweat, man, no sweat. Absolutely. Right. Well, thanks thanks so much. Okay, All right, guys. boys, go. <laughs> Peace, Peace out, brother. Peace out. Take care. All right, take care, man.